Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll visit a young beef industry leader on her family's ranch, show you how a speed rower can improve the haying process, and see how a Maryland farm hits home runs with retail beef promotion. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Ochsner. Thanks for joining us. Topping our news this week, a report released by the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress cites the importance of agriculture and specifically agricultural exports to the American economy. The report notes that the United States is the world's leading exporter of agricultural products with a record value of $141.3 billion worth of U.S. farm and food products exported in 2012. Additionally, the report says each $1 billion worth of agricultural exports supported 6,800 American jobs. Former U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Mike Johans recently spoke at Kansas State University and shared his thoughts on the value of trade to the agricultural industry. We need good trade policy. You know, if you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, 95% of the world's population doesn't live here. They live in another part of the world. But the one thing we see is that as incomes improve and people have more disposable income, they want to improve the diet for their family. And oftentimes, that means protein. That means Nebraska beef, Kansas beef. It means the products that we raise here so well. And joining us now to tell us more about the value of exports to beef producers is Phil Singh. He's the president and CEO of the U.S. Meat Export Federation. Thanks so much for coming to the show. Pleasure to be here. It sounds like there's some exciting news for U.S. beef producers in terms of opportunities in the international markets. Give us some highlights. Well, it's, uh, it's very good, uh, very amazing news for us this year. Um, through the first uh, eight months of this year, we're up about 10% on a value basis, mm. a little over 1% on a volume basis. That equates to about $255 per head for a fed steer. And also it's about 15% of our U.S. production that's now being exported. So you can see we've made dramatic gains over the last 10 years. Real money and real value. What are some specific markets that are driving that growth? Probably the, the chief market this year, the big locomotive of growth would be, be Japan. Mm. We're up about 50% in Japan this year over last year. Of course, the agreement to open the market up further to 30 months was initialed on February 1st of this year. So we're performing very, very well in Japan. Uh, Mexico also has been a very strong performing market force, as well as Canada. And, and you know, Phil, we put a lot of the, the issues behind us, the BSE issue clearly, and, and uh, some of the trade barriers that we've dealt with, but there are still some challenges. Maybe you can speak to those. Well, we have some still some challenges even on the BSE front. Yeah. And China, are the, the largest and probably the, fat, the definitely the fastest growing market internationally is the Chinese market, and that's still close to us. Uh, the Australian market is close to us. That's a market that, uh, that we see as a, as a primary competitor from the Meat Export Federation standpoint as we, we engage the Australians all over the world. Mm -hmm. And of course, Saudi Arabia has capriciously closed their market as a result of the last case here in the United States. So, mm. so uh, we still have some markets that we have to deal with. And of course, the Russian market uh, closed to us on February 11th, and that, that extracted some pain as well. And there are some additional trade agreements on the horizon. Maybe you could uh, tell our viewers a little bit about those. Well, I think the uh, probably the, the one that's the furthest along, there's been 19 different sets of negotiations, is the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, that negotiation has uh, pretends very well for us because Japan right now has a 38.5% duty. Uh, it's the world's third largest economy, and we see a tremendous potentials in Japan as that duty would come down mm -hmm. under the TPP scenario. Uh, TTIP, which is the, the European agreement, uh, we see that where 40% of the world's GDP between the United States and Europe is involved in this, and so we see a opportunity in, in Europe as well, but probably Asia presents the most opportunity for us. And there's other markets that we have agreements in that we just have to further enforce in order to keep that going. Very good. Well, thank you so much for all you do for beef producers in opening up these markets and creating opportunities for us. It's our pleasure. To learn more about the work of USMEF and U.S. Beef Exports, visit our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. 
Although beef producers may know something about the work the beef checkoff program does to build beef demand, there are still many who may not see how checkoff programs impact their livelihood. One young leader in the beef industry is convinced of the value the beef checkoff has to the future of her ranch. We have more from reporter Brian Baxter. Whether she's on horseback moving cattle, writing a blog on her computer, wrangling her four kids, or working alongside her husband Ira, Kim Brackett is one busy rancher. We have a cow-calf and stalker operation. Uh, it's a multi-state operation. We have black Angus and red Angus cattle. And we're very busy every day with the kids and the cattle. Beyond the ranch, for the past five years, Kim has served as a volunteer leader on the Cattlemen's Beef Board. She's a believer in the value of checkoff demand building programs and the difference they can make for beef producing families like hers. This is our self-help program to promote beef. Nobody else is going to do it for us. We need to make sure as producers that we get out there and promote beef to our consumers both domestically and globally. But on the other hand, what the checkoff does, enhancing beef demand, that's ensuring a future in this industry, my ranch for my children. One of the challenges now is that with fewer cattle in the country, checkoff dollars collected are down. So beef board members like Kim have to find ways to do more with less in promoting beef in a variety of areas. One of the ways we've been doing that is through partnerships. We partner with grocery stores and restaurant chains, um, companies such as A1 and Sutter Home and even the American Heart Association. The health influencers, dietitians, nutritionists, that continues to be a key area of focus for the beef checkoff. Making sure that those influencers have the information about the nutrient profile of beef. We've also strengthened our own Beef It's What's For Dinner website. A beef industry leader and hardworking rancher, Kim was named one of the 40 under 40 in agriculture, people who are helping to meet the challenge of feeding a growing global population, including with efforts such as promoting increased U.S. beef exports. Absolutely. We're right here in our own little ranch. We don't see outside of our, of our country very often, and we need to be able to reach those 95% of the population that's outside of the U.S. borders, and that's where the checkoff comes in, and it works for me on my ranch. From the Brackett Ranches, I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We appreciate so much the work of Kim Brackett and all the volunteer leaders who serve the beef industry so well. On the policy side of the coin, you can join cattlemen and women around the country as a member of NCBA. Just give us a call. That's 1-866-USA-BEEF or visit our website at beefusa.org. Still ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. They're looking for uh, that you know, timeliness and, and the speed at what they're mowing and being able to get in that field and get out of that field quickly. We'll show you how a self-propelled windrower can speed up the hay cutting process. Plus, we'll head to Maryland to see how one beef operation is working with a baseball Hall of Famer to boost burger sales. Don't go away. We'll be right back. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD TV. At Merck Animal Health, we are dedicated to improving the health and well being of animals through innovative science based solutions, products, treatments, and services to ensure a dependable, affordable food supply. From cattlemen to consumer, from farm to family, we're with you every step of the way. We work where you work. What drives you drives us. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. You're not responsible for the weather, just the cattle. And Rangeland works as hard as you do to deliver performance, production, and profitability. Cattle need consistent nutrition. They'll get it year-round with Rangeland products from Lando Lakes. Deliver what they need free choice in weather-resistant loose minerals and mineral and protein tubs. Get the most out of your forage. See your Lando Lakes co-op for products that will stand up to whatever Mother Nature throws at us. Weather's coming in. Rangeland. Consider it done. Welcome back. 
Getting hay harvested on time is a primary concern for farmers and ranchers across the country. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter has more on a piece of equipment that allows you to travel faster and get hay down more quickly than ever before. Bevel Family Farms is a cow-calf and commercial hay operation located in southern Georgia. Although the hayside started small, John Bevel says things have taken off over the past several years. My wife's family did hay for years and raised cattle and we just kind of took over into that field and it just kept growing and growing until we reached a point where, you know, it was full time and, and uh, we, we do a lot of custom work, we, we do a lot of hay for ourselves. Between what we cut for our own barns and what we cut for other folks, we, we do about 500 acres of ground and uh, we cut that three or four times a year depending on the weather. The Bevel family's hay ground is spread out over several different fields, some many miles apart. So speed and performance are critical. That's why they turn to New Holland's speed rower, self-propelled wind rower. There's a lot of competition for hay ground, so we, we go as far as 30 miles to cut some of our hay. And we were running, you know, several cutters, several tractors, and several men and we needed to slow some of that down, so we went to the one cutter. We also needed to be able to control our environment a little better. We have short windows on the hay production here in the south. You may, two to three days is a pretty long span, so we needed to be able to cut down on drying time, be able to cover more area in a shorter period of time, and that, you know, that really kind of helped us do that. The wind rower, I can go in there and take a 53 acre field and cut it down in three hours, three to four hours, as with two eight foot pull behind type cutters, disc cutters, it would take almost all day. For a cattleman or a rancher to own a self-propelled wind rower, um, I, I would say that he has to have uh, specific conditions on his acreage that would allow him that, that he needs to go uh, maybe faster, so the speed at cutting is important. We have three models. We have the Speed Rower 130, the Speed Rower 200, and the Speed Rower 240. And the Speed Rower 130 is our four-cylinder machine. Um, it's right there at around 130 horsepower. And then we have two six-cylinder machines, the 200 and the 240. And uh, the, we've been in the self-propelled wind rower market uh, since 1965. And through the generations, uh, we've come up um, uh, obviously evolving with innovation and design and engineering design and really um, I'd say we've become a leader in the self-propelled wind rower market and our speed rower is part of that hand forage offering that that New Holland has that we are that we're the smart brand we're the innovative brand and we're excited to have the, the speed rower uh, new this year the Speed Rower also has a factory installed three range hydrostatic transmission option which provides road speeds up to 24 miles per hour, the fastest in the industry. This enhances productivity and efficiency by spending less time on the road and more time cutting crop. You have a one, two and three uh, toggle switch inside the cab. So one and two are your mowing speeds. Uh, basically, you're going to be uh, probably going up to speeds while you're mowing up to eight, 8 to 10, maybe 12 miles per hour, depending on the conditions. Uh, the second range will bump you up to 18 miles per hour, and then that third range, which is the high-speed transport, gets you up to 24 miles per hour. It's a, it's a road-only speed, so what that does is it allows you, when you're done uh, cutting or swathing, it allows you to go from the field to that next field by saving time. Time saved on the road really is, you know, time saved in your overall operation and, and in uh, the length of time that you're cutting. And what that means uh, for the operator, for that owner uh, of the machine, the, the owner of the crop, um, he can cut sooner, which allows that hay and forage crop to be able to dry down during the prime time dry, drying uh, hours of the day. And really, at the end of the day, it equates to more and, and better hay and forage quality. We'll have more from Georgia when we return. Stay with us.
The new Speed Rower Series self-propelled wind rowers are smart for the way you cut hay or swath grain. The Speed Rower gives you superior luxury with the Comfort Ride cab and patented rear axle suspension. Combine this with New Holland's IntelliSteer auto guidance system to maximize operator ease and efficiency. Looking for more speed? New Holland's new high-speed transport option gives you road speeds up to 24 miles an hour, so you spend less time on the road and more time cutting crop. Visit your New Holland dealer to learn more about the complete lineup of New Holland equipment, in addition to all of the benefits available to cattle producers. Hello, I'm Kevin Ochsner, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Each week, we travel the country to bring you the latest cattle industry news and information. Check us out at cattlementocattlemen.org or on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back. Let's return to Georgia and reporter Brian Baxter with more about windrowers and how they can save you time in your hay field. When a speed rower, self-propelled windrower is teamed with a Durabine disc head, HS sickle head, or the new Duraswath draper head, productivity climbs even more. The key is picking the right sized head for the job. Producers can select disc or sickle heads from 12 to 19 feet and draper heads to swath at widths of 25 to 40 feet. The Comfort Ride cab on a speed rower provides optimum visibility, plenty of room, and comfort. A floating console with a command grip multifunction control handle puts the speed rower at the operator's fingertips. If you take a look at our cab, the cab is all mounted on springs and that really helps with the ride of the cab. Along with that, we have rear axle uh, suspension um, so not only is our cab suspended, but we also have our rear axle suspension. So we have a patent design back there that will really help with uh, uh, going over some of those, those waterways or pivot track irrigation uh, tracks. It is smooth. I mean, yeah, we got hog holes in some of our fields and we'll hit them and you won't hardly even fill them. I mean, the airbags, they, they support it good as far as comfort. The cab is uh, it's got its own suspension so it pretty much floats. Then as far as room inside the cab, it's very roomy. You, I mean you don't feel clustered or anything. You, you got plenty of room in there. Operators can program two cutting height memory positions and can make changes on the fly with a press of a button. Of course one of the keys to success for any commercial hay operator is getting the right cutting height. An operator might want to change the cutting height for one of any number of reasons. Number one, uh, height of stubble. Uh, if a fella is cutting with a machine and you're going for a uh, maximum amount of tonnage being put up, then you want to cut lower towards the ground because your goal is just to cut as much as possible. But more isn't always better. And that's really true when we're cutting plants or grasses for animal nutrition. You know, the goodie's not at the bottom. So uh, if a fellow wants to have better uh, nutritional feed for the animals, he may cut a little bit higher. Precision farming calls for technology that's accurate, easy to understand, and smart for the way you farm. Speed rowers, self-propelled wind rowers have an integrated IntelliSteer auto guidance system that's fully installed and tested. This means pass-to-pass -pass overlap becomes non-existent in wide cutting and swathing applications. Generally, auto guidance allows you to uh, get the most out of your machine in the most efficient way. Uh, it's going to allow me to uh, eliminate my operator error, perhaps, in not using 100% of the cutting width of, my, of the head in front of me. Um, and it's also going to help just generally with operator fatigue. Uh, you don't realize how many things you're really paying attention to when you're, when you're steering the machine yourself. Uh, so using auto guidance allows you to sit back and relax, let the machine do the driving, and let you, let you focus on uh, other things that are happening in the cab and watching wind rower performance. 
Auto guidance will allow uh, cattlemen to achieve a 4 to 12 inch uh, pass to pass accuracy with their cutting head. Uh, so whereas they may give themselves a little more gap on the head just to be certain they aren't skipping anything in the field, this allows them to get that much closer and utilize all of the head in front of the machine. No matter the crop, speed rowers, self-propelled wind rowers allow producers to get the job done more quickly than ever before, while still delivering the power and performance operators need. That's why Bevel Family Farms will continue to rely on their speed rower to help them make top quality hay. Uh, we're basically a three-man operation and we, we cover a lot of ground. As I said, a lot of it's spaced out and so like my son John, when he, you know, he does most of the cutting and so he's able to get in it and cover several fields by himself without any outside assistance and all. So I can send him on to do that and, and it saved us a lot of time. We see a lot of commercial operators, um, guys that are doing a lot of acreage, uh, larger farms, la larger uh, ranches. Uh, they're looking for uh, that you know, timeliness and, and the speed at what they're mowing and being able to get in that field and get out of that field quickly. And that, that's why we have a lot of operators going to that self-propelled windrower uh, machine. Reporting from Georgia, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. For more on windrowers or any other New Holland equipment, just visit their website at agriculture.newholland.com. Or you can visit our website, that's cattleman to cattleman .org. We'll have more right after this. This business can take time away and become more of your family than your actual family. My days were tough. I had a lot of doctoring, a lot of pulling. Now our days on the feed yard are happy days. It's more about looking at the cattle and enjoying what we're producing versus the alternative which is pull and treat and bang our head against the wall. We have never wavered from Draxon. We've seen the benefits just keep getting better and better. Follow me to Tennessee. Join your fellow cattlemen in Nashville for the 2014 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's the oldest and largest convention for the beef industry, and it's great for education, networking, and fun. Plus, check out the NCBA Trade Show for the latest technology. It's the 2014 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show, February 4th through 7th in Nashville. Visit BeefUSA.org for more. What do beer, baseball, and beef all have in common? Besides being the ingredients for a great Saturday afternoon, those are just a few of the marketing angles implemented by one registered Angus operation. This unique Maryland operation focuses on raising top quality beef and is also skilled in successfully marketing their product right in their own backyard. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Russell Nemitz has the story. We feel like we're a a family working together producing uh, high quality beef product even though we you know, aren't related genetically. When Dean Bryant joined the Rosetta Farm team nearly 20 years ago, he came with an eye for producing top quality beef. The quality is important because we want, want to produce the best eating experience that we can. Rosetta Farm is a registered Angus operation located in Moncton, Maryland. And while much of the United States is still recovering from drought, Rosetta Farm has received more than the normal amount of rain this year. But not even the weather deters them from producing a high quality product. And we feel like a high marbling product, which is what our definition of quality is, is important. And so we do everything we can from, from genetics through management to maximize the genetic ability to, to marble. You know, that involves uh, the right feeding programs. We like to have young calf-fed cattle as opposed to cattle that are, that are backgrounded and killed later. Uh, we feel like younger cattle will be more tender, which is the other component of, of quality. And then we use uh, high energy diets to finish the cattle on to help uh, develop that marbling as well. And despite the wet weather, there's a pretty big benefit to their northeastern location when it comes to their feeding programs. We have access to, 
to high quality byproducts. Uh, a lot of the food industry is located here with the Hershey chocolate plant, uh, the Kellogg's cereal processing, uh, various other industries, and we particularly tied in with, with Trogue's Brewery, getting their brewery byproducts on, a, on an almost a daily basis. Uh, we can get those products cheaper than we can buy hay, uh, so we uh, feed a lot of those byproducts in the wintertime to, to supplement our hay and uh, also in the summer for the pasture. But there's more to Rosetta Farm than meets the eye. In addition to their registered Angus operation, they also have their own branded beef program, which gives them a highly sought after local flair. A lot of people focus on local products now in our area and in a lot of areas of the country, but with having Black Angus beef right there locally, it's a, a perk for our farm. We are in several restaurants and grocery stores, and we also do a lot of on-farm sales to our neighborhood. People can stop in anytime Monday through Saturday pretty much and get beef right at the farm. We offer a high quality product that they can add to the store that's local and right now in this area local is a, is a, is a big selling point and it makes them unique and works out uh, quite well for them to differentiate their stores using our product. Dean's wife Marcia helps market Rosetta beef and if you think people bypass the ground beef with so many New York strips, ribeyes and tenderloins for sale, think again. We have um, the Rosetta hamburgers, which is uh, our number one seller, and we call it our steak burger because with the ground beef, we dry age the ground beef for 14 to 21 days. Most people think hamburger is hamburger, but as part of our quality, we dry age the whole carcass. So even our hamburgers taste like dry aged steak, and that's a product that probably differentiates us the most from other high quality products. And just on the other side of the freezer doors, their burgers even have a claim to baseball fame. Cal Ripken has been a lover of Rosetta beef for quite a while, and he approached us about doing a product with us and, and selling it through our giant grocery stores. So we, we are doing the Rosetta steak burgers in a box um, that's called the Cal Ripken burger, and it's a very popular seller. Cal Ripken Jr. was a Baltimore Orioles player who made it to the Baseball Hall of Fame. He's known best for breaking Lou Gehrig's record for most consecutive games played, and now he helps promote Rosetta Beef. Cal Ripken has been a longtime customer of Rosetta Beef, and it was a, with him being a local sports celebrity, it was a good opportunity to, to partner and, and make something like that work. No matter what cut of beef you're looking for, Marsha and Dean are committed to making sure their customers are completely satisfied. We get a very good reaction from anyone that has tried our product and it's once they have eaten a Rosetta product, it's hard for them to turn back to go to any other product. We say once you try it, you'll be hooked and they're definitely hooked. I want my customers to be very happy with what they're getting and we always say that we want you 100% satisfied. That's what our signature is, is a high quality product. Reporting from Rosetta Farm in Moncton, Maryland, I'm Russell Nimitz for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. From beef marketing to freedom to operate issues, why not join NCBA in pressing forward on key issues that impact cattlemen by becoming an NCBA member? Just give us a call at 1-866-USA-BEEF or visit our website, that's beef USA.org. We'll be right back. Join producers from around the country at the 2014 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Nashville, Tennessee. It's an event that, that we will never miss. I love seeing the enthusiasm. I think it's great. It's perfect combination and the perfect time to hold the NCBA convention. Join your fellow cattlemen for the latest cattle industry news, education, networking, and fun. Plus, at the NCBA Trade Show, get the latest in industry technology for the cattle business. This trade show is one of the best trade shows that is out there. It's amazing the amount of industry and businesses that come here to be a part and, 
and there's no other place that for those of us as beat producers can go to have this much information in one place. So follow me to Tennessee for the 2014 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Nashville, February 4th through the 7th. Learn more at beefusa.org. To stay up to date on beef industry news and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, check out beefusa.org. You'll find news on both the Federation of State Beef Councils and the work of NCBA on Capitol Hill. Plus, link to NCBA programs like the blog, Beltway Beef, updates on the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show, and the latest from NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Connect today at beefusa.org. Welcome back. As the world population continues to grow, cattlemen must produce more beef with fewer resources. Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Matt Fleck has the latest on a USDA funded research and extension project that will help develop the tools ranchers need to improve feed efficiency in their own operations. The sustainability of the beef industry continues to be a major topic of discussion, and as the cost of inputs continues to rise, efficient use of feed becomes even more important. Feed efficiency, or the amount of body weight gain from a pound of feed, is one key to improved performance and profitability. I think feed efficiency is, is a huge part of our operation. As far as the bottom line, with feed costs increasing and availability maybe being a little more limited, uh, I think it's something that we're all looking at. It's usually close to you know two-thirds or three-quarters of our total cost, so it represents such a large portion of the cost. If we can make animals more efficient, then we have potential to you know, save some of that money that we spend on feed. Feed efficiency is not a new measure, but it is one that is receiving more attention as costs increase. Unfortunately, to this point, the beef industry has made minimal progress in accurately measuring efficiency. We're good at measuring outputs, but you know inputs like intake are hard to quantify, so historically it has not been measured a lot, or if it's been measured, it's been basically measured on a pin basis, which we can equate back to a specific sire, potentially, but you know very difficult to measure on an individual animal basis. If we can identify some of these cattle that are more efficient and propagate them, that on down the road will have a lot of value to us. One group of researchers is working to expand what we know about feed efficiency. They're part of a USDA-funded project called National Program for Genetic Improvement of Feed Efficiency in Beef Cattle. The main goal of the project is to identify genetic markers associated with feed intake and from that information develop selection tools for feed efficiency in beef production. It's a, a multifaceted project. It involves 20 individuals from 10 different institutions across the country. The project has goals of trying to understand genetically what creates genetic variation in feed efficiency and how can we develop tools based upon that understanding that will allow us to estimate the genetic merit of animals for feed efficiency without having to directly take intake data on those animals. The project leverages existing feed intake and composition records from historic research projects and those collected by U.S. beef breeds and collects new records to build an even more comprehensive resource. One of the major challenges of feed efficiency research is collecting and measuring individual intake. But at the University of Illinois, they have a system in place which allows cattle to be maintained in a pen environment, yet have individual intakes recorded. We have a system called the GrowSafe system that allows us to do that. All of our cattle have an individual electronic ID tag in their ear, and then these bunks have an antenna around the top, and it reads that electronic ID, and there's a set of scales under under each bunk and that allows us to know what uh, each individual animal eats at each meal and then we put that together at the end of the day you have the average dry matter intake and yet we've still maintained that pen environment so you have the same uh, social interaction and behavior that you would have in a pen feeding system. Early research results have found estimates of heritability to be moderate for different measures of feed efficiency. 
researchers are capable of generating molecular breeding values for feed intake in Angus, Hereford, and Simmental. Many breed associations are taking advantage of this work. What we found is using genomic tools, we're able to uh, explain upwards of 30 to 40 percent of the phenotypic differences for feed intake or residual feed intake uh, across those different populations. So uh, the, the heritabilities that we see just using genomics align with what we would expect using traditional phenotypic information, which suggests that we can actually develop tools that could, could help uh, and aid in selection for these types of traits. So where I think we'll see this technology going is it's just going to become a blending um, and, and in 10 years time we'll look back and we'll have pedigree information, we'll have phenotype information, we'll have marker information of various kinds all getting blended together in, in a production system that comes up with one estimate of the EPD of, of, of an animal. The researchers are talking to breeders and breed organizations about providing access to project data and discoveries. This would allow the inclusion of genomic-based information to flow into traditional genetic evaluation systems and selection indexes. Ultimately, it will allow for the development of breeding programs for more efficient animals. In addition, the group is working with several international collaborators to pool data on common breeds. The goal is to increase the accuracy of generated MBVs for both U.S. and international breeders. This trait is, is very important internationally, uh, and there are a number of groups that are trying to gather large amounts of phenotype data and genotype data on similar breeds throughout the world. Genetically, those animals may look a little bit different to the cattle we have here in the U.S., but they're not that different, and so by pooling data, um, we'll be able to potentially develop more models for more breed associations uh, to develop uh, genomic breeding values for them. We'll have more on the USDA feed efficiency project right after this. It's the official monthly publication of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. The National Cattleman is produced exclusively for NCBA members and includes coverage of the news and events affecting our industry. From Capitol Hill to the far side of cattle country, the National Cattleman provides information NCBA members need. Every issue includes market analysis, feature stories, and practical management tips. Start receiving your copy of The National Cattleman. Call 866-USA-BEEF or go online to beefusa.org and join today. I am an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member because our nation's capital is a long way from home and in my cattle operation. I pay my dues to keep a staff here in D.C. working on behalf of the industry and working on my behalf every day on all the issues. The NCBA doesn't pick and choose what issues it works on. It works on every issue, every day, on behalf of all the cattlemen across the country. NCBA membership is important because there are policy makers and regulatory agencies making decisions that affect your operation every day. Join me and thousands of other cattlemen across the country. We are better together than we are alone. Your support is needed. We are NCBA membership. Join us today. Join NCBA today. Head to BeefUSA.org or call 866-USA-BEEF. Welcome back. Let's return to reporter Matt Fleck with more on the USDA's feed efficiency study. Since each producer is directly involved in making genetic decisions, it's important for them to be aware of the tools and methods available to improve feed efficiency. A unique and valuable component of the current project is the integrated nature of the research program. About two-thirds of the funds from the project grant are research focused. Um, about one-third of the funds in the project are, are dedicated to um, uh, extension and outreach activities to um, help producers learn about DNA technology, genomic selection, how to use um, uh, selection index and, and EPDs for feed efficiency. To make that improvement, we hope they will um, in feed efficiency of beef cattle. 
At the end of the day, we really want this uh, technology to be deployed in the industry. And to that end, uh, we integrated uh, an existing project called the Weight Trait Project, whereby 24 seed stock producers in the Northern Plains region, representing seven different beef breed associations, are actually engaged in the evaluation of the research component. So it's really a way for, for key technology adopters to test drive this, to gain some comfort level with it, and then to, to actually utilize it for selection purposes. Improving feed efficiency could provide benefits both to feedlot and cow-calf producers, so researchers are also evaluating intake differences between concentrate-based and forage-based diets to see how they relate to each other. The goal is to identify cattle that are efficient on both types of diets. One of the other aspects that this project is going to look at is the relationship of feed intake and feed efficiency on a high grain diet compared to uh, a forage diet. Because a lot of the data that's been collected and contributed to this project is feedlot uh, focused. And in the feedlot and feed yard, we're feeding a high grain, high concentrate diet to those cattle. Yet the cow herds maintained uh, on pasture and fed forage. And so we need to understand what is that relationship. The cattle that are uh, efficient on grain, are they also the same cattle that are efficient on a more uh, forage based diet? This study may also result in important environmental benefits. Preliminary findings by the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center show feed efficiency has a surprising impact on greenhouse gas emissions. They found that uh, the cattle that were more efficient actually had a higher methane emission. But now you have to come back and ask the question, but wait a minute, if they're more feed efficient, does that mean that they eat less food over a feeding period until we get them to slaughter weight? And the answer is yes. So when you look at it from the perspective of per animal taken through to, to finishing or per pound of beef produced in the production system, then the animals that have um, higher feed efficiency produce less total methane in production. But on a per pound of dry matter intake basis, they actually produce more. For producers, the results of this USDA study have the potential to provide tools and information that will allow them to select more feed efficient animals and lower feed costs, ultimately improving profitability. Clearly the objective here is to make cattle more efficient and if they're more efficient we produce more beef with, with less feed intake. At the end of the day that helps the beef industry relative to sustainability. It aids certainly in world food security by producing more with less and it helps the producers in the beef industry that are making the bulls, that are buying the bulls to produce terminal calves. It helps them remain more profitable in a competitive marketplace. The feed costs and production costs, uh, you know, are, are, have been increasing on such a rapid rate that any time we can implement some of this stuff into our program and, and be more efficient in our own operations, it's probably going to be the difference of staying in business or not. I'm Matt Fleck, reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. To read up on the latest findings yourself, go to the project's website at www.beefefficiency. Org. And you can always check out our website at cattlemanandcattlemen.org for more information and video replays of your favorite stories. We'll have more right after this. Hi there, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory, and welcome to our farm outside Nashville, Tennessee. When we go to work, whether it's on tour or here at home, we wear the West. That's right, where it's that perfect snap shirt or that perfect pair of boots. When you wear Roper, you wear the West. Learn more about us, Joey and Rory, and about Roper Western wear at eroper.com. Telling the truth and being real And feeding my family a home-cooked meal That's important to me That's important to me garden and watching it grow. I am an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member. I am an NCBA member because our nation's capital is a long way from home and my cattle operation. I pay my dues to keep a staff here in DC working on behalf of the industry 
and working on my behalf every day on all the issues. The NCBA doesn't pick and choose what issues it works on. It works on every issue, every day, on behalf of all the cattlemen across the country. NCBA membership is important because there are policymakers and regulatory agencies making decisions that affect your operation every day. Join me and thousands of other cattlemen across the country. We are better together than we are alone. Your support is needed. We are NCBA membership. Join us today. Join NCBA today. Head to BeefUSA.org or call 866-USA-BEEF. We know who made that hitch. We know who cut the steel, who milled the ball, and who welded the seams. We know who tested, measured, and checked. We even know who thought the whole thing up. We're B&W, and we know your hitch. Because we don't make them halfway around the world. We make them all right here. B&W. Trusted. Feeding the world is a big job. The Dr. Kenneth and Caroline McDonald Inc. Foundation has committed more than $2 million to fund research at the University of Nebraska, Oklahoma State University, and Texas A&M University to improve efficiency in the cattle industry and to hold an annual cow-calf symposium. The first symposium was held at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln on September 12th and 13th. This cow feeding research supports the entire beef industry. Bud's dad was a good horseman, and he taught his boys to be good horsemen too. They rodeoed, but as time went by, they made their own lives, but they did come back home to the ranch pretty often to visit the folks. On one visit, Bud and Dad went out to look at the horses. Did I tell you about that bay horse I got from Buster? I don't think so, Dad. Does it have anything to do with your limping? <laughs> Yeah, it was the strangest thing. I just made a little circle. I was coming round down by the gate where the creek is, and dang, if I didn't just slip off. Fell right on my butt, left a big old bruise. I couldn't believe it. Maybe I'm getting old. Well, Bud came home for Christmas, and Dad asked, Did I tell you about that bay horse that Buster fausted off on me? No, said Bud, feigning interest. What happened? Well, I only had him a couple weeks, you know, and I rode him out to check the well, and when we were coming back, right down there by the creek where that gate is, Kurzawe! I mean, that snide bogged his head and blowed up. I mean, it's Casey Tibbs all over. I hung in there, boy, but he pitched me into that board pile. Splinters went everywhere. Lucky all I hurt was my ribs. You know I can still ride them, but he got me that day. Well, Bud was back for the Brandon in April. What's new? Did I tell you about that man killing Bronk, that bay horse that Buster stuck me with? You mean? Yeah, nearly broke my hip. I took him out to the junipers, you know, where the creek is and down by the gate, and kerzow, he came unglued. I mean, he stuck his nose in the dirt well. He went to bucket. I laid into him. I mean, you knew I could do it. But he bucked across that creek like he was auditioning for the finals. And then he wiped me off on the gate post. I tell you, son, he is one crooked bugger. Dad sat back with a sigh and scratched himself. Well, one thing for certain, said Bud. You keep telling that story, and one of these days, you're going to get him rode. This is Baxter Black and Bud from out there. Thanks, Baxter. We can always count on you for a good laugh. Don't go away. We'll have more right after this. Ever wonder where the beef checkoff dollar goes and what it buys? The Federation of State Beef Councils is made up of the 45 qualified state beef councils that collect the $1 per head beef checkoff. Each council keeps control of 50 cents, 
and sends 50 cents to the Cattlemen's Beef Board for use in national beef checkoff programs. Many states also choose to send a portion of their share to the Federation to expand national and international efforts. As a division of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the Federation of State Beef Councils works to support an effective state and national partnership, helping to increase beef demand through research, promotion, and education. Because producers themselves direct these programs, your beef checkoff dollars are in good hands. Learn more about the Federation of State Beef Councils by visiting beefusa.org. Follow me to Tennessee. Join your fellow cattlemen in Nashville for the 2014 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's the oldest and largest convention for the beef industry, and it's great for education, networking, and fun. Plus, check out the NCBA Trade Show for the latest technology. It's the 2014 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show, February 4th through 7th in Nashville. Visit BeefUSA.org for more. Welcome back. For this week's Legacy Photos, we're heading to Iowa for a closer look at Bittersweet Acres, one of this year's Environmental Stewardship Award winners. Don't forget, you can send us pictures of your farm or ranch by visiting our website at cattlemanandcattlemen.org. Next week on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll visit with our friends from Zoetis, hear from experts on topics ranging from working with veterinarians and nutritionists to BRD solutions, plus a closer look at the Progressive Beef Program. All that and much more, including another visit with our friend Baxter Black. Well, that's our time for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks so much for watching. I hope we'll see you right back here next week on RFD TV.